Good morning, guys. Welcome to the show. This is another show in the uh, Kings of Judah division. So I'm going to cover King Abijah today. Also, his name is spelled Abijam within the Book of Kings, but that's only in one chapter. Within other chapters where his genealogy is given, it's Abijah. So I'm just going to call him King Abijah just to keep it simple. So I'm not saying two names the whole show. It's kind of like if your friend's called Jim, you don't want to call him James Jim the whole show. So keep it simple. And, you know, he's primarily referred to as King Abijah. So I'm going to stick to that. But, um, yeah, we're going to cover King Abijah. And he's not as long as some of the other kings that I've done. So this won't be, you know, as long of a stream. But it's still going to be informative, guys. I promise you there'll be a few things that you, you know, probably have overlooked just like I have. What's going on, Rudy? Good morning, bro. Um, and yeah, the link's in the chat. So if anybody wants to hop on and join me and uh, go through the presentation with me, feel feel free. Um, so yeah, that, that's, uh, you know, the option for anybody watching. Don't think you have to know much about the stream because we're going to go through it slide by slide. And, you know, you guys can just add your insight, you know, as we go. So I would like to have other people hop on with these, but I understand, you know, some people look at it and say, well, I don't know who King Abishai is. I haven't, you know, read that chapter in the Bible in a while. and That'll keep them away. But I want to encourage everybody, like I said, everything you need to know about them is going to be on this presentation. I literally have every verse of the Bible that, you know, is about him in the book of Kings and Chronicles in the presentation because he's, you know, not written of, as much as other Kings, it's a shorter, you know, section on them. So uh, I have every verse in this uh, presentation. So you guys could read it right now with me during the presentation, but obviously no pressure, whatever you guys like to do. If you want to sit in the chat and uh, ask questions or comments from there, feel free to regard this. I'd like to start this off with uh, numbers 624 through 626, which is known as the, Aaronic blessing. So in Hebrew, you can see there it's the Ha Berakah, and some spellings will be different on that depending on you know who, who's uh, scholarly Hebrew spelling they want to use. So that's just one of them. Just be aware of that. But this is called the Aaronic blessing. So the priests, the sons of Aaron, obviously, um, and this is also one of the oldest, if not the oldest, prayer in um, Israel. So it's real short but it's a good way to start the show. So I'll start it with this. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his face upon you and give you peace. So I hope that gives some people some peace right now. And also we can start the show now and uh, just have good vibes. So here we go. This is King Abijah. So again, if you guys want to join the stream when I'm sharing my screen, you got to tell me in the regular chat. Otherwise I won't be able to see that you're in the back. So let me know in the regular comments if you can. What's going on, Hillary? <laughs> yeah, it's instant medicine, man. It's in instant medicine. You still got to hop on one of these days, Hillary's email. So no pressure today. But like I said, I got every verse on King Abishai in this presentation. So, you know, you guys will be reading it right along with me. But um, do whatever's comfortable too, though. All right, so here we go. And for anybody that's looking for my other presentations on the other kings of Judah, just go into uh, my channel and I have a playlist specifically for them. So you can find them in the main videos or you can go to a, a playlist that I got set up for the kings of Judah. Actually, I got to take down my uh, – I already have it down. Okay, good. I got to take my icon down. Actually, I'm going to share my whole screen too. I don't think you guys need my face here. Despite how handsome I'm, I am, I don't think anybody's going to miss my face. I think it's better to make the screen big so you guys can see the scriptures and the other information. So do it this way. All right. All right. So King Abijah of Judah. And we can see right here, like I said, these are all the chapters in the Bible that are written about him. So it's not like some of the other presentations I did on Hezekiah or Uzziah or Josiah. Those guys have more written on them. This is a shorter section. I'm sure as you guys are familiar, I mean, some of the judges are only two or three sentences, you know, of the 12 judges of Israel, 
uh, four or five of them are just two or three sentences. And it's the same in the book of Kings. So some of the Kings are shorter, you know, sections, but nevertheless, there's still, you know, some important stuff that occurs. So I want to go through it. Um, his uh, scriptures are one Kings 15, one, you know, eight verses, verse one through eight. So he, he doesn't even have the whole chapter. There's actually three different Kings within that one chapter. Um, so that's, that's, to give you the perspective of how short his section is in chapter uh, 15 of one Kings, but um, Chronicles has a little more information on them. So chapter 13 of Chronicles has more. So luckily we got that for the presentation, but let's get started here. And uh, you know, again, ask questions or comments as I go, guys, I'm open to, you know, entertain anybody's insight, or if you want to come up on the panel and add anything, feel free. <clears throat> Regardless, his name is Abijah, or like I said, it's spelled Abijah or Abijam. We know in the Bible sections on the kings, um, the, or even throughout the Bible, they'll spell names slightly differently at times. They'll do it even with prophets, obviously Hosea or, you know, Isaiah. You know, you look in the King James Version, how they spell it. They'll say O-C or A-C-C-C-S or something for Isaiah. Same idea, same concept. Anybody that reads the Bible regularly is obviously familiar with it. Again, I'm just going to say Abijah, so I'm not saying two names every time I say his name. He's the son of Rahabam, and his mother is Makkah, so I'm on the second bullet here. <clears throat> the second, He's the second king of Judah after the split. So his dad, Rahabam, was the first king after the split. So when the kingdom got divided into northern and southern kingdom after King Solomon. His dad, Rahabam, was the first king of Judah. And now uh, Abijah is the second king of Judah. His reign is only three years, though. It's approximately 914 B.C. to 911 B.C. And these are uh, the scholarly dates for these things. This isn't as accurate as me telling you when Barack Obama or George Bush Sr. was president. We don't have the year, you know, that precise but this is essentially what scholars if you google it will agree upon is is pretty accurate as far as you know within a year or two of when it actually occurred because they just take the kings and do some basic math and you know they'll time it by the assyrian invasion fall and also the babylonian um you know fall so that's how they get these dates but his dates around 914 to 911 bc so think about it guys this is a person from 3000 years ago and it's a king of judah and he reigned in jerusalem and he's keeping alive the davidic seed so that's not like underestimate even though he's got a shorter section in the bible what this man's importance was in the history of the biblical narrative he's in the genealogy of jesus christ he carries on the davidic seed um when he started reigning um the the northern kingdom king jeroboam was in the 18th year. So again, guys, this is an important concept. If you don't read the Bible a lot, make sure you understand, because I didn't grasp this concept for a long time, and it was really confusing. When the Bible says Israel in the book of Kings, it's only referring to the northern kingdom 99% of the time. And if it's referring to the southern kingdom, it's going to say Judah. So that's something you really got to understand. It's it's like, you know, when this country was split in America for the Civil War, the North and the South, you know, the, you got to realize when it says Israel, it's only referring to the Northern tribes. So Jeroboam, he's the king of the Northern uh, side, and he's in the 18th year at this point when King Abijah starts. And him and Rahabam, King Abijah's dad, had been, you know, going at it with conflicts, you know. They almost got into a war immediately when the kingdom got divided. Rahabam wanted to invade, but God sent a prophet to tell him not to, Shemaiah. And they didn't because they listened to the prophet. But throughout, there was always tension, and they did have some minor wars back and forth. So he, Abijah, being Rahabam's son, he's already inheriting conflict with Jeroboam. And in 1 Kings 15, 3, this is the line that, you know, we're also familiar with. A lot of us Bible believers, you know, they tell you right in the beginning, you know, how long they reigned, you know, whose son they are, and um, if they did right in the eyes of the Lord or if they did evil. So that's, you know, it's that simple. You either did right or you did evil. 
So one Kings 15, three says, and he walked in all the sins that his father did before him. And his heart was not wholly true to the Lord, his God as the heart of David, his father. So unfortunately, Abijah failed the test for, you know, the judgment of the King. So his three years weren't ideal, but you know, again, we'll see parts in the presentation where it wasn't all bad. So just keep that in mind. Also, um, Abijah had 14 wives, so he had 22 sons and 16 daughters. So, again, he's, he's you know, the king of Israel, excuse me, king of Judah. So he's, he's getting, um, you know, plenty of children to carry on his legacy and plenty of wives. That's just how they were doing it back in the day. Um, contemporary prophets, this is a harder one because the only prophet in, in the stories, which again, there's only eight verses in one Kings 15 and then one chapter in chapter 13 and two Chronicles about them. The only prophet that was named within the scriptures for a hundred percent certainty was Edu the seer. So he was the same one who recorded his dad Rahabam's reign and Edu the seer is also the only prophet that's a hundred percent tied to being a contemporary of Abijah. However, if we want to do some logical deductions, like I said, Shemaiah um, and Ahajah, the Shiloh knight, they were both in uh, Rahabam's dad's, excuse me, Abijah, Rahabam's dad's time. So again, his dad's reign, you know, only ended three years prior before his and Shemaiah and Ahajah, the Shiloh knight existed then. And also we know Elijah comes in the 38th year of King um Asa's reign who um that that's in uh excuse me is it in the 38th year yeah King Ahab's reign which is in the 38th okay so it's either King I think it's King I think I have a typo there it's King Asa's reign in the 38th year is when Elijah comes into the Bible so Elijah is not mentioned in the Bible until the 38th year of King Asa's reign, which is his son. So at the bottom here, it's, it's actually supposed to say King Asa, not Ahab there. So I apologize about that. But um, either, either way, Elijah's within 38 years, but most likely he could have been a contemporary or at least within five to 10 years. We don't know. Like I said, it just tells you in the Bible that he started in the 38th year of Asa's reign, which is uh, Abijah's son. So he starts in the 38th year of his son's reign. So it's likely that, you know, he could have been around in his time frame. All right. Bear with me now. The computer's not changing. So, all right, here we are. All right. So these are um, all the verses in the book of Kings. Like I said, it's not a ton written about them at all. This is all you'll get in the book of Kings. So I figured why not just give everybody every verse so they could see it. And you see on the side here, on the right side, I got the summary of it. So basically all you're going to get from reading this, but we'll read the eight verses anyway, is it's a three year reign. He did evil and he had a war with Jeroboam. So I'll just read it quick, but you guys can read it while it's on the screen too, obviously. Now, in the 18th year of King Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, Abijam, and again, they're spelling his name in the variation of Abijam in 1 Kings 15. Um, Abijam began to reign over Judah. He reigned for three years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Makkah, the daughter of Abishalam. And he walked in all the sins that his father did before him, and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God as the heart of David his father. Nevertheless, for David's sake, the Lord his God gave him a lamp in Jerusalem, setting up his son after him and establishing Jerusalem, because David did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and, um, and did not turn aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life, except in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. Now there was war between Rahabam and Jeroboam all the days of his life, the rest of the acts of Abisham and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? And there was war between Abisham and Jeroboam. And Abisham slept with his fathers, and they buried him in the city of David, and Asa, his son, reigned in his place. So it'd be kind of hard to uh, make a presentation off of just that. So luckily, Chronicles has more information. But like I said, I figured there's only eight verses in Kings. I might as well show you guys them all. 
So let's move on now because, like I said, Chronicles has more on the story. So Chronicles has uh, a good amount on them. And, and also besides that, we're going to talk about some other topics because they come up while, while we break down what Chronicles has on them. So bear with me here while we go through this. I'm going to take a quick drink. So the scriptures are on the top here from uh, 2 Chronicles 3 through 7. It starts off with war with Jeroboam. And this is something I touched on last time, guys, when I had the presentation with his dad, Rehoboam, King Rehoboam. Under Abijah, him and Jeroboam had essentially what we had in our country, the Civil War. Because in the Civil War in America, 620,000 troops died total, right? And we're going to see in this that 500,000 of the northern kingdom Israel end up dying. So let's just go ahead and start breaking it down, though. Abijah went out to battle, having an army of valiant men, 400,000 chosen men. And Jeroboam drew up his line of battle against them with 800,000 chosen mighty warriors. Then Abijah stood up on Mount Zerarim, that is in the hill country of Ephraim, and said, Hear me, O Jeroboam, and all Israel. Ought you not to know that the Lord God of Israel gave the kingship over Israel forever to David and his sons by a covenant of salt? Yet Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, a servant of Solomon, the son of David, rose up and rebelled against his Lord. And certain worthless, and this is important, and I'm going to break this down. The ESV is the translation I'm using, and they use the words scoundrels and irresolute in these two verses here. So you'll see in the green here, scoundrels and irresolute. These are not good translations, guys. And I know I go on the King James a lot, and, and people that are King James only or, or prefer it sometimes think I'm just, you know, going at the King James for no reason, but I'm going at, you know, whatever I don't think is correct. And right here, the e I put the words because it's what the ESV has, but I'm going to break down why these words aren't very accurate. So he's insulting them. So essentially Abijah is insulting them from Mount Zeramim. He's insulting the people, the troops that are with them. They're not in Judah. They're in the middle. So in the, they're in the northern country. They're in Ephraim on this mountain and he's telling them, you know, God's on our side. You know, David has the covenant and, you know, the, the wording covenant of salt is really, you know, interesting too, because it shows you, you know, like Jesus said, you know, you are the salt of the earth, you know, so it's a good wording to see that he says he has a covenant of salt with David. So you could definitely break that down, you know, a lot in, in, in its own way. But again, where I'm at here with the word, you know, where he's insulting him and he says certain worthless scoundrels gathered about him and defied Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, when Rehoboam was young and irresolute and could not withstand them. The, the thing is this, I'll just continue to read my slides to break it down, because the thing is this, there are important aspects which are somewhat lost in our modern translations. So Again, I'm using the ESV and it used scoundrel and irresolute in verse seven. So the footnotes in the ESV tells me what the original Hebrew was, right? So the original Hebrew for the word scoundrels is actually sons of Belial. And I'm going to break down what that actually is. Sons of Belial and irresolute is soft of heart. So they changed the Hebrew for whatever reason, these translators took a liberty and instead of just writing the actual, you know, translation, what was there in the Hebrew sons of Belial and soft of heart, they had to modernize it and they put scoundrels and irresolute, which is really taken away uh, a deep meaning here. So I'm going to break this down. So Abijah's dad, when it says soft of heart, is talking about Rahabam not being prepared or wise, obviously. So it, it's, Using irresolute is, is all right. It's not as bad as the scoundrels that they use, but it's still, I rather see soft of heart because that's more poetic. It's more beautiful. It's what's actually written. So just give me what's actually written, you know? So this is a case where I definitely don't like what the ESV did and changing these words around. But, you know, again, I'm going to get into Sons of Belial in a second. One thing I want to point out about Sons, uh, the word heart in Hebrew 
because I just learned this watching the Yale Divinity School, and I thought it was interesting. And I, you know, I want to share it with you guys. There's two words that they use in the Bible for heart. One is Leb, and one is Kilya. So the one is L E B, and the one is K I L Y A H. And what's important to realize is Kilya is also the word they use for kidneys. So what we have in our Bible translated heart is actually kidneys. So granted, we, we see the word heart and I have all the verses where you can see this. So if you go to like on the far right here in Job 19, 27, Psalm 7, 9, 16, 7, 26, 2, 73, 21, or Jeremiah 11, 20, 12, 2, 17, 10, 20, 12, We'll have the word heart in all those verses when really the word in Hebrew that was there was kidneys. So it's it's really interesting. <laughs> There's no poetic beauty in the in the kidneys, but the point of the matter is 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 in he, the Hebrew thought process they they had the kidneys instead of where we put the word heart at times because the kidneys was something that clean, cleans the blood. So think about what the kidney's function is. In Hebrew, the we all know the life is in the blood, but they have the word kidneys there. Hey, what's going on, Joe? Um, you know, they we have the word heart, but the actual word was kidneys and all those verses that I have on the right. And think about what the kidney's function is. Like I said, it cleans your, your blood. So it gets the toxins out of your blood. So them using the word kidneys to, to talk about like a pure person just shows how great of an understanding they had of what the kidneys actually do in your body, cleaning your blood of toxins. So I just thought it was important to point out in this specific verse here, when it talks about heart, um, it, it does use the word LEB in this specific verse up here that I just read in two Chronicles uh, 13, three through seven, when it talks about, um, soft of heart, irresolute. It is the word lab. But if you go to any of these other verses, it uses the word kidneys. I'll just go to one real quick just to show you guys, just because I thought, like I said, this was something interesting I learned. Um, and, you know, what's funny is the guy who's teaching the Yale class was obnoxious about it and acting like, oh, that's a bad thing. Uh, the Hebrew people are so clueless because they're using kidneys instead of heart because, you know, they're just clueless you know, people when really, if he actually thought about it and understood what was going on, like I said, is the kidneys clean the blood and get rid of the toxins. So these people understood something that was clearly probably not coming from them, but coming from God. So right here, Job nineteen twenty seven. So look what we have. And I'll look at other Bible translations too, because I have the ESV here. So this is the ESV. It says heart. Let's take a look at some other translations, what they have. Um, okay, King James actually did a good job, though, here. They put, though my reins be consumed within me. So they didn't put heart there. So I'll give uh, King James some credit there. The NIV does use heart. Um, King James did a good job. They didn't put the word kidneys, though, so they didn't get an A, but they uh, they didn't put heart. So that, that, that's good because, you know, you don't want to – like I said, confuse people and use heart when it's lab and then use heart when it's also kill ya. But um, still, they should have put the word kidneys and not though my reins be consumed within me. But I'll just show you guys. Like I have the ESV or if you have the NIV, you have the word heart here. You go to the inner linear, it's going to be the word kill ya and it's going to talk about your kidneys. So right here, kill ya, you go to the inner linear. And what's kill ya? It's going to be kidneys. And the thing that's interesting is you can see that 18 times it's used. Sometimes in Leviticus, it's just talking about like a sacrifice of an animal, and it's just blatantly talking about kidneys. And then sometimes it's talking about the heart, like we have in our verses. So I'll just look at it this way and show you guys real quick. So from the interlinear version, you can see here, like in Exodus, it's going to just say, you know, kidneys for sacrifices. Same thing in the Viticus. It's the word kill ya for kidneys. So you guys get the point that it does mean kidneys, uh, you know, a bunch of times there too. But then again, like I said, here, look, now it changes. So in Job, they used it for heart. 
and Psalm 7, 9. They used it for heart. I mean, read some of these verses, Psalm 7, 9. Oh, let the evil of the wicked come to an end, and may you establish the righteous, you who test the minds and hearts, O righteous God. And really, it's saying, you who test the minds and the kidneys. So this is some real interesting stuff. Um, you know, I just wanted to point it out. Again, this is Psalm 16, 7. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel in the night. Also, my heart instructs me. It's not his heart that instructs him. It's actually his kidneys that instruct him. So just wanted to point that out to you guys. I mean, I know in this specific verse, it talked about lab. So it was just the other word for heart. But just because I had just learned this, I like to share it with you guys. And, uh, you know, you guys just can be aware of it. So these verses on the right side are all the verses in, you know, the ESV where they use heart for kidneys. But again, the more important word is the ESV change in scoundrels here. They changed sons of Belial to scoundrels. And next page here, I'm going to show you why that's terrible. So let's just read in context again here what's going on. Abijah is on Mount Zeramine. He's yelling at Jeroboam saying he's basically, you know, a nobody that should have been serving King Solomon because he was a worker. King Solomon had him working, helping to build the temple. And all of a sudden, when the kingdom got divided, he rose up and became king. And Abijah says, you know, you're a worthless scoundrel, but really he said, you're a son of Belial. So let's look at what a son of Belial is, because he really was saying something more significant than the word scoundrels get across. And it's also not going to be, you know, coming across the same in any other translation. doesn't matter if you have the ESV, the NIV, the King James, they all fail at this. I can look at what the other translations say. They don't say sons of Belial. That's the problem. So right here, look. The seven, verse seven scoundrel being sons of Belial is literally saying the, the word scoundrel when it should say the devil. Belial is literally the devil. So if you go through and you look in ancient Apocrypha or even in the New Testament, which I'll get to at the bottom of the screen, but you can Wikipedia sons of Belial and you'll get the same stuff I got here. I, I was already familiar with it from reading the 12 patriarchs, but yeah, in the 12 patriarchs, Jacob's son, Reuben uses it. He says he was tempted by the spirit of Belial when he slept with Jacob's concubine. Um, that, that So, excuse me, Reuben uses it for when he slept with Jacob's concubine. Reuben slept with Jacob's concubine, as we know, Bilhah. And then Levi uses it to say something that's opposite the law of God. So choose between the law of God or the works of Belial. And then if you look at this, you know, it, it's just basically just the devil, man. So this guy wasn't saying scoundrel. He was saying you're a son of the devil, son of Belial. So the basic etymology of the word Belial means lacking worth. But the word Belial is in our Bibles or sons of Belial because sometimes it's Belial and sometimes they add the Semitic idiom son of, and it's in our Bibles 27 times in the Masoretic text. And as you see here, 15 of the times it's, just, it's used with the Semitic idiom sons of, which to point out that also in Mark three seventeen when Jesus said, you know, to uh, the sons of Zebedee, James and John, your sons of thunder. That sons of was a common Semitic idiom. So in that case, he's he's using it in a positive manner. Obviously, Jesus is telling two of the disciples, your sons of thunder. But the sons of was a popular Semitic idiom. So half the times, 15 of the 27 for Belial, it's sons of Belial. And it's literally saying sons of the devil. What we get in our, our Bibles as um, translated as idlers or worthless or wicked or calamity sexual depravity um it's excuse me those those are characteristics of of, of belial uh, being an idol or being worthless wicked calamity sexual depravity or in general opposition to god we we have it usually translated in our bibles as wicked or worthless a couple of the examples are like eli's sons so in the book of samuel we know the priest eli He's got two sons and, and they're sleeping with women that are right outside the tent of meeting and they're, they're eating the fat of the sacrifices. In our Bibles, all we get is the word worthless when really the Hebrew Masoretic text calls them sons of Belial, which is sons of the devil. And I'll get into it more because it's you could do your own Wikipedia search. It's sons of the devil. 
But another spot it's used is when the the, the Benjaminite people um, in the Book of Judges rape the uh, the woman and kill her. So the, they're trying to have sex with the man. And then the man sends out his concubine and they rape her and kill her. And uh, he cuts her body in 12 pieces and sends it out to all the tribes. And the Israelites don't know what to do with the people if they're going to, you know, lose the tribe of Benjamin or not. And then they have them, you know, go and marry a bunch of women who are dancing somewhere and go and take wives. But they were literally, you know, thinking about what are we going to do to keep the tribe? Cause these guys are so depraved. That's another spot where it's called sons of Belial and we get the word wicked or something like that. So again, you guys can type it in yourself, but there's 27 cases where the word Belial is in the Bible. 15 of them is sons of Belial with the, you know, common Semitic idiom, but look how, like I said, what sons of Belial means in these other texts. So in the dead sea scrolls and other second temple, Apocrypha, it's it's used often. And one of the Dead Sea Scrolls books, The War of the Sons of Light Against the Sons of Darkness. So think about that. That's the title of the Dead Sea Scrolls book. The War of the Sons of Light. We all know Jesus is the light. Against the Sons of Darkness. Belial is the leader of the Sons of Darkness. Okay? So you tell me what that is to us in modern times. Who's the leader of the Sons of Darkness? Okay? It's the devil. And other Dead Sea Scrolls and Second Temple Apocrypha, they use the word Belial, and it's just the devil. I mean, I could go on and tell you more and more examples. If you type it into Wikipedia, you'll see Belial's the, associated with the, the, the mark of the beast number and the dark angels and just anything in opposition to God. So basically, just to go back, well, I'll read the New Testament uh, the, the one time it's Belial's used in the New Testament is by Paul in 2 Corinthians 6.15. And it says, What concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? So that's the only time you'll see it in the New Testament uh, in 2 Corinthians 6.15. So if you guys want to go to that verse and type on the word in the interlinear, feel free. But it's basically, again, just showing you it's Christ versus Belial. So to go back just to show what I'm saying here is the the insult that um, Abijah is given uh, Jeroboam, who's the northern kingdom, you know, kingdom king of Israel. It's not this minor you're a scoundrel that the ESV uses. So, you know, I, I think it's just good to be aware of what the actual original words are, guys. So I just wanted to point out those two things there. I know the soft of heart, you know. What, what wasn't as, you know, persuasive, but to me, you know, it's good to know that, you know, like Eli's sons. And also, like I said, the, the people, when they, in the book of judges, the Benjaminites, they're called sons of Belial. It's good to know, you know, the truth. And, and, you know, we get, you know, the dumbed down or the simplified English version sometimes where we'll just get the word wicked or worthless. And, and it doesn't, you know, pack the same, you know, punch. I mean, it doesn't carry the same, you know, it's not telling you these people are the sons of the devil, you know? So I just wanted to point that out. I'll move forward though. All right. So two Chronicles 13, eight through 12, you know, this is when, you know, I'll just read it. Cause these are the verses. Like I said, I have every verse included in here. So I'm separating up into three parts. You know, I just had, you know, two Chronicles 13, three through seven, the first verse or two was just saying he was at war with Jeroboam. Anyway, and his mother was Makkah. It was repeated. So anyways, and now this is the scriptures. And now you think to withstand the kingdom of the Lord in the hand of the sons of David, because you are a great multitude and have with you the golden calves that Jeroboam made you for gods. So remember, the Israelites, the, the northern kingdom, they have 800,000 to the 400,000 that they have in Judah. So that's why he's saying, you know, you have a great multitude, you know, you think you're going to win. So have you not driven out the priests of the Lord and the sons of Aaron and Levites and made priests for yourselves like the peoples of other lands? Whoever comes for ordination with a young bull or seven rams becomes a priest of what are not gods. But as for us, the Lord is our God and we have not forsaken him. We have priests, the Lord, every morning. Excuse me, 
We have priests ministering to the Lord who are sons of Aaron and Levites for their service. They offer to the Lord every morning and every evening burnt offerings and incense of sweet spices, set out the showbread on the table of pure gold, and care for the golden lampstand that its lamps may burn every evening. For we keep the charge of the Lord our God, but you have forsaken him. Behold, God is with us at our head, and his priests with their battle trumpets to sound the call to battle against you. O sons of Israel, do not fight against the Lord, the God of your fathers, for you can't succeed. So, like I said, in the beginning where it said he did evil, he, he followed the sins of his dad, you know, he didn't follow God with his whole heart. That's obviously the overall, you know, conclusion of his three-year reign. But as we see in these verses here, he is prioritizing, you know, the, the priest doing the temple worship properly. The problem is, as I'll get into later in the show, is he didn't get rid of the other high places and the other uh, the other gods, the idols that were in the land. So that's what it means when it says he, he did the sins of his dad, Rahabam, because Rahabam allowed, you know, uh, male cult prostitutes in the temple and just ashram poles and that type of thing, along with worshiping God. So, you know, it, it's, it's a mix of, they didn't want to just worship one God. They were treating them like, you know, you, a buffet, you could have them all. But what, what he's saying here too, which is important. So in the first couple verses here, where he's saying all the priests, so in verses, um, Nine, where it says, have you not driven out the priests of the Lord, the sons of Aaron and the Levites and made priests for yourselves like the peoples of other lands? So that's important because it, it goes back to his dad's uh, Rahabam's reign. So you have to read, like I said, the relevant background. So now just go down to the second bullet where I'm at here um, in two Chronicles 11, 13 through 17. When Jeroboam first became king of Israel's ten tribes, all the priests and the Levites came south to Judah when Jeroboam set up the idols and allowed anyone to become priests. So that was a true occurrence at the uh, initial stage of Jeroboam's reign. So he's talking trash to him, but he's also saying the truth that you don't have any of the priests. We have all the priests. So you got to go back to 2 Chronicles 11, 13 through 17 to see that. So that that that's true but it's also a little bit of an exaggeration because the priests came down and they were righteous for the first three years of Rehoboam's reign and i'm familiar with this because i just did Rehoboam's show right before this but at the fifth year Rehoboam, like i said had the male cult prostitutes in the era ashram poles and he fell away from god so it's only a part truth that he's saying they do have the priests but like i said they're also worshiping other gods and committing sins too so he's telling a half truth there but that's the uh historical background of, of what he's talking about all the priests did leave northern israel and um you know that's true and you could find it right in two chronicles 11 13 17 might as well show it just because i put most of the scriptures in here i put all the scriptures in here for his uh his information but i like to show things too because I don't want you guys to just take my word for it. I'm just familiar with it because I just did the show on Rahabam. But um, what was it? Two Chronicles, what I say? 11, 13? Yeah. Okay, so here we are. So no, that's not it. What did I just say? Two Chronicles 13, 11? That's what it was. No, why am I, why, I just saw the verse. All right, hold on, sorry. I forgot it already, guys. Two Chronicles 11, 13 through 17, okay. That's what it was. I don't know why I didn't trust it. All right, so this is, like I said, this is Rahabam, his dad's reign. So right here, the priests and the Levites come to Jerusalem. So you see it right there. And then, and the priests and the Levites who are in all Israel, so again, that's talking about the northern kingdom. This is when Jeroboam first starts to reign, presented themselves to him from all places where they live. For the Levites left their common lands and their holdings in Judah and Jerusalem because Jeroboam and his sons cast them out for serving as priests of the Lord. And he appointed his own priests for the high places and for the goat idols and, the, and for the calves that he had made. 
And those who had set their hearts to seek the Lord, the God of Israel, came after them for all the tribes of Israel to Jerusalem to sacrifice to the Lord, the God of their fathers. So you see here, guys, right here, and I'll just read the next verse because like it says, it summarized what I said too. So, and they strengthened the kingdom of Judah, and for three years they made Rehoboam the son of Solomon secure, for they walked for three years in the way of David and Solomon. But Rehoboam reigned for 17 years, guys. So you see in the very next verse here, it tells you that, um, well, not the next verse because that's a little genealogy, but. Essentially, right after this, he gets into um, right here in the fifth year. So right here, it says three years they were faithful for Rehoboam. But in the fifth year of King Rehoboam, because they had been unfaithful to the Lord, Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against them. So this, like I said, is from last show, Pharaoh Shishak came. He's a real historical figure. I, I Check out my show on Rehoboam if you want to see this. But I'm just showing you that, like I said, the priests all did come down and they and they did do righteousness for three years. But Rahabam reigned for 17 years. And it tells you right here in the fifth year of his reign, they were unfaithful to God and Egypt started attacking them. So to get back to the presentation, just to show you guys what I was talking about there, that he's, you know, to get back to verses eight through 12 here, he's speaking half truths because he's saying God's on our side. The priests do everything that is you know supposed to happen as far as the law of moses but he he's also exaggerating because like i said they're doing wickedness too in the land all right but the very bottom here we do know that god is with jerusalem so this war that's about to happen god is with jerusalem on and he is going to preserve the seed of david so in this situation even though he did you know evil and didn't follow God with his whole heart. It seems like in this situation, God is obviously with him because of the temple worship and just carrying on the seed of David. So these are the next verses and these are the last verses and chronicles about him, essentially. So Jeroboam had sent an ambush and, and, and let's just look on the side here. These are the three major things. The priests, they blew the trumpet. So they're fighting with Abishah against the northern kingdom, Jeroboam. They blow the trumpets. They shout. The men of Judah shout. God's with them. Judah relied on God. This is all in the scripture here, as you can see. I'm just reading the summary on the right here. And Judah kills 500,000 of the Israelites. It doesn't say any. It doesn't say how many, but it doesn't even name one uh, Judah person, Judah soldier that died. But it just tells you that Israel... They, they tried to run away, and 500,000 of their 800,000 total got killed. So, again, think about this, guys. It's like the Civil War. In the United States Civil War, a total of 620,000 soldiers died. So this is a biblical story. You know, we probably – I know myself, we never probably put much weight into it. Oh, yeah, the war between Abijah and Jeroboam, that was a big deal. Well, it was. It was 500,000 people that died in the northern kingdom. So it was a huge war in the second second king of Judah between the first king of uh, northern kingdom Israel. And after this war, Jeroboam, he was, he was crushed. He was not, never a strength again. So I'll just read these verses now, but that's the summary of it. But I also want everybody to just remember this and absorb it because it's something that I've glossed over before, but it's literally a big war. So we shouldn't. And we see that God's with them and that tr the, the priests are blowing the trumpets and, and doing the shout, just like in the book of Joshua when they're attacking Jericho. So the righteousness was on the side of Judah. All right, Jeroboam. And this is, like I said, the last verse is in... Um, in Chronicles on Abijah. So Jeroboam had sent an ambush around to come come upon them from behind. So the northern guys trying to ambush him, Jeroboam, lost his troops were in front of Judah, and the ambush was behind them. And when Judah looked, behold, the battle was in front and behind them. And they cried to the Lord, and the priests blew the trumpets. Then the men of Judah raised the battle shout, and when the men of Judah shouted, God defeated Jeroboam and all Israel before Abijah and Judah. The men of Israel fled before Judah, and God gave them into their hand. 
Abijah and his people struck them with great force, so they fell slain of Israel, 500,000 chosen men. Thus the men of Israel were subdued at that time, and the men of Judah prevailed, because they relied on the Lord, the God of their fathers. And Abijah pursued Jeroboam and took cities from him, Bethel with its villages, and Jeshanah with its villages, and Ephraim with its villages. Jeroboam did not recover his power in the days of Abijah, and the Lord struck him down, and he died. But Abijah grew mighty, and he took 14 wives and had 22 sons and 16 daughters. The rest of the acts of Abijah, his ways and his sayings, are written in the story of the prophet Edu. So again, that mention right there of prophet Edu being the one recording this, That's the. these are all the verses, guys. That's it. We just read the eight verses in Kings and the 22 verses in, in Chronicles, chapter 13. That's all we got for Abijah. But again, I tried to make sure that you guys understood that there's a lot going on there that, you know, we should look into a little deeper, especially the sons of Belial thing. I'm, I'm always going to remember that, you know, um, I'm going to make sure I do my due diligence in the interlinear and, and look at all 27 cases where it says Belial because that's the devil. And, and our Bibles, like I said, I got the ESV. It uses the word scoundrel or sometimes it just says worthless. You know, it diminishes what really is being said. It's really a much more impactful word in the actual Masoretic Hebrew text. But um, again, these are backgrounds now, like like I just went through. So 2 Chronicles 11, 22 and 23 shows us. So I just read every verse that's in, you know, the Book of Kings and the Book of Chronicles on them. Now I'm going back into other books that just mention his name or if it doesn't mention his name, it's just relevant because it, it can give us a better understanding of what happened that the scriptures didn't say anything about. So 2 Chronicles 11, 22 and 23. So, and when Rahabam, his dad, appointed Abijah, the son of Makkah, as chief prince among his brothers, for he intended to make him king, which obviously we just read, he ends up becoming the king because Rahabam had like uh, 60 sons or 20... Now, he had 28 sons and 60 daughters, his dad, Rahabam. So the fact Abijah made him chief prince is preparing him to become king. And he dealt, and this is talking about Rahabam here in verse 23 at the top. And he dealt wisely and distributed some of his sons through all the districts of Judah and Benjamin and all the fortified cities. And he gave them abundant provisions and procured wives for them. So I'm, I'm just showing you... Uh, <laughs> I'm just showing you guys that this isn't in his section that's in Kings or Chronicles, but this is his dad's section, the chapter before. And it tells you that his dad appointed him chief prince. And then it tells you his dad put his sons, the princes in cities in fortified cities with abundant provisions. So it's likely that uh, Abijah obviously was in a city appointed. He got wives just like the verses say here. So we don't see that in his actual story, but if you think and you just do some logical deductions, it can give you some background, all right? So it's very uh, likely he was in a militaristic position, and when Pharaoh Shishak invaded in the fifth year of Rehoboam's reign, it's likely that Abijah was either fighting or just retreating to Jerusalem. We don't know, all right? Also, in 2 Chronicles 15, 16, and 17, so these are the chapters about his son, King Asa. It tells you that his mom, uh, excuse me, yes, his, his, uh, his um, even Makkah, his mother, his wife, Makkah. So even Makkah, his mother, uh, excuse me, it's, it's his mother, excuse me, Makkah's his mother. I got confused for a second there because the verse. Makkah is Abishah's mother from Rahabam, all right? So even Makkah, his mother, King Asa, removed from being queen mother because she had made a detestable image for Asherah. Asa cut down her image, crushed it, and burned it in the Brook Kidron, which is right outside the city wall of Jerusalem, guys, the Brook Kidron. But the high places were not taken out of Israel. Nevertheless, the heart of Asa was wholly true all his days. So this is showing you guys, in his son's reign, his Abijah's mother, who you know was his actual mother, Makkah, 
she was making ashram poles and she was considered the queen mother. So this is one of two times. Again, we already did Queen Athalia of Judah. Um, queen, queen mother term for Makkah. Abijah's mother is the only other time I see the word queen used, but we obviously can assume there are other queens if they married the king and they were prominent. They were queen most likely. Obviously, they had that title, but this is the only other time I know besides Queen Athalia that this title is actually in the scriptures, but I could be wrong on that. But either way, she's referred to as the queen mother and she's worshiping Ashram. So that shows you that what's not written within Abijah's reign, because all we saw is him, you know, getting into that conflict and, and fighting with Jeroboam. We didn't really get to see what he did right or wrong, you know, because right there it seemed like he was fighting with God. He did what was right. This shows you that the high places were still up because this is during King Asa, his son's reign, and the high places are still there, as you can see. So um, during uh, his Abijah's three years, he clearly didn't take them down. And not only that, his mother was worshiping other gods. So that supports why God's got the summary that he did evil and didn't follow him with his whole heart. Also, 2 Chronicles 16, 3 and 4 lets you know that the Syrian king uh, Hazel was the the was the Assyrian king at the time, and he had a, a covenant with with um, Abijah because right here the the verse with Asa is Ben Hadad, the next Syrian king, saying that you know I have a covenant with you just like our fathers did. So I'll read that verse. So right here, this is uh, two Chronicles sixteen three and four. So. There is a covenant between me and you as there was between my father and your father. So that's why I put the verse here, guys, because Asa's father is King Abijah. So this is, you know, obviously relevant because it's telling you that. So I got one more. Uh, sorry about the technical stuff, guys. I got one more uh, slide. All right. So this is just the summary slide. <laughs> yeah. You already know. You are, good guess, Jamie. Good guess. This presentation included every verse written about Abijah's reign in the Book of Kings and Chronicles. And the only other verses mentioned Abijah are the genealogies. So 2 Chronicles 11.22 is the one that I just mentioned um, about his uh, you know three-year reign. And we know that Abijah made him chief. Uh, Abijah was made chief prince by Rahabam, and the civil war between Jeroboam of the northern kingdom of Israel and Abijah. That's obviously the climax of his reign. So the main thing is he he had a five hundred thousand, you know, death toll of the northern kingdom Israel out of the eight hundred thousand total. And we should just remember that Abijah, Rahabam's son, had a big war with Jeroboam. And again, look for that sons of Belial, the, the you know word in the interlinear or the word Belial, because it's a lot more impactful than the words that we have, you know, worthless or wicked. You know, it doesn't really carry the same magnitude of the original Hebrew. And besides that, he was buried in the city of David. His son Asa reigned. He was a righteous king for 41 years. And the approximate reign, again, was from 914 B.C. to 911 B.C. So that's it, guys. Uh, Abijah, not a very long one. Sorry, I had some technical issues there at the end. Trying to close this and find StreamYard. But uh, I hope I hope you guys found something new. But, uh, you know, I tried to, you know, get as much as I could in there. Like I said, there's not tons of scriptures on them. I read every verse that was written about them in Chronicles, every verse that was written in uh, uh, Kings. All, all the verses that were written were in this presentation. And then I, you know, like I said, went back to Rahabam and, uh, you know, just did some logical deductions. And that's about it. So anyways, God bless. Thanks for watching and take it easy. So I'll do another show uh, soon, as soon as possible. I don't know which king I'm going to do yet, but King Abijah is, uh, you know, the sixth king of Judah I've done so far. So just go to my playlist if you guys want to see the other ones. Take it easy. God bless.